I'm Giovanni Singleton, Lunch Poems Coordinator, and thank you all for being here today. Um, first, I'd like to invite you to sign up uh, for our email list, which is over on the librarian's desk, um, and also um, on our website, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu, you'll find uh, videos of uh, today's reading and as well as uh, all of our previous readings. So please uh, go check out our YouTube channel um, and have some poetry over the summer. Our, uh, this is the final event for our 2016-17 season. Please come back in the fall on September 7th where we have our annual kickoff event. Um, so today, uh, here to introduce uh, our stellar student uh, uh, poetry award winners and Lunch Poem volunteers um, is incoming director of Lunch Poems and English professor uh, Jeffrey G. O'Brien. Please welcome him. Thank you. Hi there. Um, before we start hearing from these stellar readers and writers. Um, I want to thank Giovanni especially for her work as coordinator all year and every year. She does so much behind the scenes to make this smooth. So let's give her a round. And I'd also like to thank other invisible people, um, who some of whom will become visible. Um, the student volunteers, Taylor Osman and Anthony Tucci and Amanda G. Amanda will be reading today. Um, thank you for your work as well. It makes this possible. Um, yeah, so we're here to hear from students on campus. We start the year hearing from the closet readers and writers across the university. And then we have invited guests. And then at the end, we hear from people who have just recently probably contracted the permanent infection that is poetry. Um, and we're going to hear from both undergrads and grads alike. And because poetry resists rules partially, we won't go entirely alphabetically. No, it's just because Mary Mussman needs to run a meeting very soon. So we're gonna start with Mary Mussman. Um, I'm gonna be reading short bios for each reader, so I'll be hastily getting up and getting down um, between readers. And of course, these bios are an extension of their work as creative writers. So um, I have nothing to do with how they've chosen to define themselves. Um, yeah, so we'll begin with Mary Mussman with M. Mary Mussman is a doctoral student in the comparative literature department, focusing on receptions of ancient Greek poetry in Anglo and French literature since the late 19th century. In both her academic work and in her poetry, she is particularly interested in how classical texts inform conceptions of gender and sexuality, loss and grief, and transgression and secrecy. Please welcome Mary Mussman. Thanks, Jeffrey. This poem is an elegy for a friend of mine, uh, the poet Max Retvo, who died last August. It's called Greek Poetry Composition. We can't hear you very well. Is this better? Oh, great. Greek Poetry Composition for Max Retvo. In Greek Poetry Composition, we learn to write in the lesbian Aeolic dialect, the first symptom of which is silosis, a kind of forgetting to breathe or a loss of breath. The lesbian Aeolic dialect is not a literary one, but nor the normal usage at the time, what we have surmised from its residue on papyri and elsewhere, mostly Sappho, mostly Alcaeus. It was two poets who folded, enfolded me into ancient Greek, my first great loves. Let us call one Sappho and the other Alcaeus, lesbian poets or pseudo-lesbians. In published works, Sappho and Alcaeus discuss the space within which reading ancient Greek takes place. There is the requisite physical space upon one's desk of texts, commentaries, dictionaries, a lamp since it gets dark, and the mind is separate from anything else. Stutters, falters, halts, stumbles through the salt flats of archaic text. In brief, it is the experience of deep space a sensory deprivation unlike anything else. It is now nighttime. I'm with the woman I've been dating and our lesbian friend who convinces me to inhale my first and only cigarette. She invokes, invokes Sappho and her deep space of ancient Greek. This is unfair. As you know, it is like nothing else, she says. I take her cigarette in my hand, 
I choke on my own coughs. The cigarette is a lesbian aeolic euphemism for the three of us fucking a few hours later. A little breathless island of lesbos, senseless mind, a kind of deep space dwelling in the same phylum, the phylum of my desk strewn with the lesbian aeolic dialect. The last part is that what we learn in Greek poetry composition is a form of astrophysics. Despite its apparent futurity, astrophysics is not a way of thinking about the future, but the study of the movement of old things in space, like dark matter. It is a form of grief. What astrophysics physicists detect is only ever ancient particle waves that have somehow lasted across space, senseless. Thank you. Our first alphabetized reader is G, Amanda G. She studies English and creative writing, but still fits in non-academic reading, preferably at window seats or cafes or both. Her writings often reflect on childhood or are for the childlike. She is grateful for the guidance and encouragement she has received from her creative writing professors and peers over the past four years. Please welcome Amanda G. Hi, um, so I'll be reading from a pantoum that I've written, and it's called um, Laundry Business. The Laundry Business. Adults always talk when they think I'm not listening. Dad's cousin weaves us through Manhattan's rush hour. I pretend to be asleep in the back seat. Apparently, laundromats are very lucrative. Dad's cousin weaves us through Manhattan's rush hour as Dad talks about this guy who started a laundromat. Apparently, laundromats are very lucrative for Chinese immigrants who want to be entrepreneurs. As Dad talks about this guy who owned laundromats, his tone shifts. This guy became filthy rich and picked up a mistress. For this Chinese immigrant who became an entrepreneur, got pretty fast once he got what he wanted. Tone shift. This guy became filthier rich and dumped his mistress. His, um, for this Chinese immigrant, oh, sorry. Um, for this Chinese immigrant who became an entrepreneur, got, oh, I'm sorry. Let me start over on from the stanza. Um, tone shift. This guy became filthier rich and dumped his mistress. Dad didn't mention how or why. Things got ugly fast. She got what she wanted. The mistress called the FBI on that bastard. <laughs> Dad didn't mention how or why, but they are currently looking into all of his laundromats. <laughs> ever, ever since that ex-mistress called the FBI on that bastard, there is more than one type of dirty laundry. I am currently looking into starting a laundromat. Dad's cousin laughs, turning left into Chinatown. There is more than one type of dirty laundry and their smells and sounds fill the car. Dad and his cousin laugh, left turn into Chinatown. They talk, they think I'm not listening, but the smells and sounds fill the car and I am only pretending sleep in the back seat. Thank you. Pantooms are evil. Um, <laughs> Helena Yezels is an exchange student from Ghent University in Belgium, who has come to Berkeley for one semester to study creative writing. Back in Belgium, she was editor-in-chief of Ghent University's English Student Literary Magazine and coordinator of the English Student Creative Writing Group. In addition to poetry, she writes prose fiction and creative nonfiction. Helena Yezels. So I had two poems that I possibly wanted to read today, and one of them was a funny poem about laundry, so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to pick the other one, which is less funny, but uh, yeah, <laughs> bear with me, please. To my depression, I don't miss the time we were together, wasting away entire days in bed, wrapped in each other's cold embrace in dirty sheets inside a stuffy room with curtains like rain clouds, heavy with dust and numbness, and perpetually drawn. You have drifted off into my periphery, now beyond grasp, 
if not beyond sight. The pills I take are a restraining order, implemented with good reason, though I sometimes forget. And sometimes when I see you in the corner of my eye, you're simply there, always ready to slouch forward with your understanding eyes. Sorry. Sorry. And your comforting hands waiting to descend on my hunched, chastised shoulders. I'm still not sure if you're an enemy or a friend, therefore I don't know whether to keep you close or closer. For now, I like to keep an eye on you, suspicious but also wistful for your constancy and comfort and the knowledge that you, more than anyone, will always be mine. Thank you. Our next reader is Kyle Hill. Kyle is an undergraduate majoring in molecular and cell biology, or the other poetry as I call it. And he's graduating in spring 2018. He hopes his aspirations will lead him to be an astronaut, colonize celestial bodies, discover extraterrestrial life, and redefine the human experience in descending order of importance. That's my edit. <laughs> this summer he will be taking a break from research studying the Japanese language and culture abroad in Tokyo. Kyle Hill. Hearing someone talk about your aspirations really makes you have to commit, doesn't it? <laughs> so this poem is titled, Expectance. 1952. Mom picks autumn fire tulips in California springtime. Dad smokes, whiskey garnished. Love and his crystal ashtray lacquered yellow from practice. They call his name everywhere he crawls. Stop him from going too far. Still love him for doing so. September. Falling as if he is the last copper shell, arching downward from its metal home into the camouflage boom crater created by shell-shocked soldiers raging for life, liberty, and missing dog tags. Knee locked, jaw dropped, he sinks into the rising pale grief perforating from the stagnant red wounds. Help me, why I'm dying. Wounds his mother would still kiss. Now blanketed in synthetic jungle and mustard bite, hidden from his mother's and father's pleas, limbless and thoughtless, our minute man didn't make it through his first minute of red, white, and blue warranted crimes, something called war, now called childless. He's not coming home. Clocks the AK-47, 1969. Is Carter Keeling here? Okay. Um, our next reader is Evan Claven, who's a PhD candidate in the English department at UC Berkeley. In addition to dissertating, he has a few poetry book projects underway, and I owe you feedback on one of them. His poems and translations have appeared in American Literary Review, Diagram, Circumference, Poetry and Translation, Line Break, and elsewhere. Evan Claven. Thanks, Jeffrey and Giovanni, for having me. And it's a pleasure to be reading with all the other students. Um, this poem is called Alba Oblique. And Alba is a uh, dawn song for lovers. This is in four stanzas, and it's helpful to think of the stanzas sort of progressing from pre-dawn into day. Alba Oblique. Hurricane eye still lidded. Ghost gathers out of hemispheric black before downpour breaks to cull us from dream, coated patter on a taut ear of glass. My mouth open, you say you took in its babble of expired thought, echoes soft the night talked through, a throat well reflecting weather. Out from the blue, heaven is rent, wide as your arm's breadth spreading the curtain to catch sun cast through rain print and array, new leopard spots of rainbow on your skin. Such arcane angles, beauty resolves, 
the way three mirrors form a prism, in hearing now the secret life of light falling through its own transparent clothes. Thank you. And now we will leap back to the letter B and go to Matthew Bowie, um, who is from California and served ab aboard the US Bunker Hill before attending American River College and now UC Berkeley. Several of his poems have been published in the American River Review, including his selection for today, Matthew Bowie. fan of uh, E.E. E. Cummings, which I hope will come across, but it doesn't really matter if it does or not. Someone died by looking for more. My marks downplaying by the stone shore. Loving, losing, fear, time. To know her hands, she wrote her feet. Old men doubted, and none demurred. So out they withdrew among whispering words, fear, loving, losing, time. That everyone read her foot for foot. Anyone, no one, neither bad nor good, knew that someone knew what they had. They whispered their should, shouted their no. Wind, ripple, stone, sand. Here, so there, but day, thus moon, she'd scorn the this and love the soon. Storm and tree and wilt and rain, everyone's all never said to her guilt. No one fled from everyone, wandered to files and sang their growl. Dawn falls time before she whispered prayers and birthed the dead. Somewhere, someone was born, she knew. And everyone stood and saw the truth. Everyone sang for her tiny feet, quietly, quietly, in the rain and sleet. Stone, sand, wind, and ripple. But likely the sea can forgive them all. Old men forgetting they once were small by marks down playing by the stone shore. No for naught as growl breaks song, so less for less. As time soothes wrongs, someone for everyone. Sea and river, book and word, and time crossed never. No one, anyone, great and small. Nowhere, always, none, all. Birth their stone and write the same sand, feet, wind, and rain. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. Our next reader is Jesslyn Wattel. Jesslyn is a senior studying English and computer science, the other other poetry. She likes to think she needs the weirdness of poetry to balance out the patterns of real life, but sometimes she just likes the patterns. Jocelyn Wattel. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna be reading a piece called The Dog Isn't Even Dead Yet. Um, it's no longer true, unfortunately. Okay. The dog isn't even dead yet. I thought this life would be harder than it is, that I would stand on battlements and dictate to foot soldiers, that I would love too many people, speed dating suitors with name tags like pleasure or salvation in permanent marker, that I would count or be held accountable for unearned crimes, that I would redeem myself with mouth coins, that I would bravely slit a willing throat or teach a shot yearling mercy, that there would be too many choices to gun down. I didn't think that choice was a brand illusion or that I would resign myself to a contract with living or that I would be given permission to live by legal tender, but I have not been held accountable for its quotidian cruelty. I have only killed people who were far away in fractions, a third, a half, half off dog food redeemed with coupons. And it was easy to agree when my parents told me the dog would have to be put down. Nothing should sh suffer whose pain can be stopped with a long drive and a red light up his veins, the window down. It isn't a choice. Like grabbing the strongest puppy in the litter wasn't a choice, and the definition of strongest wasn't a choice, it was a puppy. It's hard to think that life should be easy and not be reconciled, but it's easy to think reconcile sounds like flip a coin, like it has already made up its mind. Thank you.
Our last reader today is Malcolm Williams. Malcolm Williams is a senior English major, finishing up a minor in anthropology, while also perfecting his natural talent for procrastination. That's why he's last. He is still not sure what he's doing after graduation, but he will figure that out later. Malcolm Williams. Uh, thank you. This is uh, it's really cool to be here. It's also uh, very nerve-wracking. It's like my most official reading that I've ever been, ever been a part of. Um, I uh, t told myself I was going to come up with something ahead of time, but I could only come up with dumb jokes about how uh, La La Land should have won the best uh, award, the best picture <laughs> award at the Oscars. So I'll spare you guys. Um, anyways, here's my poem about procrastination. The title is 10 Minutes Before Class. My laptop and I rush into the library, eager to procure the essay we spent all night crafting. He kept me awake with his constant glow, and I kept him alive by feeding him honey bunches of volts. So now we try to tell the printer how much it would mean to us if she would kindly transpose our arranged pixels onto a more traditional medium. However, the printer doesn't understand the language I beg in and won't speak to my laptop based on a difference of opinion as to the need for Wi-Fi. <laughs> People behind us start getting agitated and mutter. They don't have time to wait for us. Meanwhile, the printer taunts my laptop with error messages, and I have to separate the two before someone gets hurt. The strangers keep glaring and shuffling past us to take the printer's side. Embarrassment colors my cheeks and heats my laptop's vents. We check the time and debate if it's worth trying another library and being late. My laptop tells me it's not. I think he's just flustered, but he insists we leave. On the condition that he explains our failure to the professor, I concede. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes a wonderful year of lunch poems. As Giovanni said, please come back in the fall for the kickoff. I'm hoping to snag Chancellor-elect Crest. Um, hope, I think we'll be able to shame her into it. We'll see. Um, we also are starting to figure out the programming for next year. I know that we have former US Poet Laureate Rita Dove on board and local poet Matthew Zapruder uh, and um, Solma Sharif possibly as well and several others. So please come back next year and let's have one more hand for all the student readers today. Thank you.